Hello, church. Good morning. So happy to be with everyone virtually this Sunday. Can you believe that we are already in June? So it's been a while since I've met many of you, and I hope everyone's been adapting to this new normal, okay? In fact, you may be quite tired of hearing the term new normal because you see it everywhere, right? You go online, you see new normal, you watch TV, you see new normal, you read the newspapers, you see new normal. But isn't that true that everyone has had to find a way to adapt to a new way of doing things? And um, this, new mo this new normal really has penetrated every single part of our lives. So as an example, let me share with you a new normal which I had to kind of adapt to a few months ago. So a few months ago, I wanted to make an appointment to see a TCM doctor, traditional Chinese medicine doctor, because I had some skin issues that I wanted to check out. So I called the TCM doctor and I made an appointment in Chinese, which was already a feat for me. And um, before I put down the phone, uh, the person on, on the other line told me, oh, you know, so the TCM doctor, he would um, have to look at your tongue because TCM doctors look at the state of your tongue to assess your condition. And then she told me, oh, you know, because of safe distancing measures in this new normal, um, you won't be able to take your mask off when you are seeing the TCM doctor. So what we need you to do is to take a picture of your tongue and WhatsApp it across to us so that the doctor can take a look at the picture of your tongue while he is assessing you. So that's what I did. So there I was in my room trying to figure out how exactly do I take a picture of my tongue? Okay, so I tried to um, break it down step by step, right? So first I decided, all right, if the TCM doctor is going to have to assess the state of my tongue to kind of validate my condition, then I want to show him as large a surface area of my tongue as possible, right? So I tried to stick my tongue as far out as possible. And then I thought to myself, okay, I need to make sure that my tongue does not vibrate Wow, <laughs> I'm trying to keep it out as far as possible because it needs to be still. I want the picture to be as high resolution as possible so that the doctor will be able to see every bump on my tongue and every shade of pink. So I thought, okay, right, I'm like sticking my tongue out as far as possible and I'm trying to keep it as still as possible. And then I thought, all right, now I need to take a picture of this this situation happening right here. So then I thought, should I take a tongue selfie using the front of my phone camera? So then I tried, right? I took a tongue selfie. I don't know whether any of you have done that before, but that was my first time taking a tongue selfie. And I tried to focus it, but it didn't really turn out the way I wanted. It was just like a mess of pink. So I thought, okay, this is not a good picture for the TCM doctor to assess my condition. So I thought maybe for a higher resolution picture, I'll use the back of my camera. So then I stuck my tongue out, and then I used the back of my camera to take a picture. And then I flipped over, I looked at the picture, and my tongue wasn't even in the picture. <laughs> I don't know what I took. The aiming was just wrong. So anyway, it took me quite a while to take a picture of my tongue, which I then very sheepishly WhatsApped to the TCM clinic. Because if you try to imagine, this is a zoomed-in picture of your tongue, and it's I feel very vulnerable sending such a picture to people I don't know. And it wasn't even a good picture of my tongue. So I sent it over and I accompanied it with a voice message in Chinese that said, oh, 不好意思,我真的尽力了, which meant, oh, I'm so sorry, but I really tried my best. So <laughs> I reached the TCM clinic and um, they looked at my picture and they were like, I'm sorry. <laughs> We cannot use this. <laughs> what is this that you've just sent us? So the kind receptionist had to stand up and then lead me outside of the clinic to an outdoor, well-ventilated area where I could then unmask and she took a picture of my tongue for me. So, rather dramatic, but that was one example of a new normal that um, has affected the TCM industry. And if you think about it, this new normal really has affected every single part of our lives. The way we go to work has changed, the way we go to school has changed, and even the way we go to church right now has changed. Right now, you are able to attend service from any part of the world at any time, and who would have thought that we would be able to attend service in this way? So other than the format of attending church which has changed, 
other than being able to attend church online now versus offline, what I want to ask us today is this. In this new normal, is there anything else that the church needs to take note of so that we don't miss what God is trying to tell us through this new? Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Let me pray. Father, I just commit this time today into your hands, God. Um, I pray that you would use me as your mouthpiece and that every single word that comes out of my mouth would be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that every single person tuning in today or whenever they may be tuning in would encounter you, God, and may there be life change that comes out of today's message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, as Pastor Rodden said, as a church, we've been going through this blockbuster series called Unstoppable, where, where we've been looking at the book of Acts. And really, we've been examining the events of the church when it just got birthed after Jesus ascended to heaven, and really examining the events surrounding the unstoppable move of the good news throughout all of the world. So today, I'll be zooming in into a part of Acts chapter 10. And before I do so, I just want to give you a bit of context about how the passage begins so that you have a clearer idea of what we'll be going through. So the passage begins um, with um, these three men who are uh, servants of this guy called Cornelius. So there is this guy called Cornelius. He has sent three servants of his to this city where Peter is in to look for Peter. All right, so that is the context of it. So let's dive right in. Let me read it. Um, Acts chapter 10, 9 to 22. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. All right, so rather interesting sequence of events, which I personally have really enjoyed diving in. And because it is important for us to be familiar with the events that are covered in this passage, let me just recap so that we all know what's going on. So basically, this is an artist's impression of Peter. Peter was one of the 12 disciples who followed Jesus around very closely during Jesus' three years of ministry. So one day, Peter was at home. It's about 12 p.m. Uh, He went up to the roof to pray, and then he was hungry. And as food was being prepared for him, suddenly Peter fell into a trance. So a trance means a state of mind where you are not in complete control of yourself. So this was a specific state of mind that God created so that he could communicate something really important to Peter. Peter's senses were heightened so that he could absolutely hear what God wanted to tell him. So in this vision, there were many animals that were presented to Peter, and a voice says to him, Peter, 
Look at all of these animals. I want you to kill and eat them all. So when we hear this vision at face value and we hear that, okay, so in this vision, there are many animals and Peter is asked to kill and eat them all, we may not understand, um, so what about it is there? Then just kill and eat lah. So <laughs> what, what was so appalling about this vision or about this ask that the text says Peter responded, surely not, Lord. And in today's English, that would have been equivalent to Peter saying, no way, whatever you're asking me to do, no way will I do that. And the voice repeats this three times. And in characteristic Peter version, he denies it three times. So what was it really about this ask that made Peter protest so defiantly? And also, remember the question I asked at the beginning of the sermon? Is there anything about this new that the church needs to take note of so that we don't miss what God is trying to tell us? So to find out what was so appalling about this vision, we need to do a little time travel. Actually, not so little because we're going to travel back 1,500 years. 1,500 years ago, from the point when Peter was having the vision, Peter's ancestors, the Israelites, had come out of Egypt where they were slaves. So they were now in the desert and they were trying to figure out, okay, now that we have left our old way of life behind, we need to create a new way of life. So how do we go about creating this new way of life and what do we do? So in the desert, God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, and on top of that, God gave a whole set of very detailed laws that govern every single part of how they were meant to live their lives, which included certain foods that they were allowed to eat that were called clean foods, and certain foods which they were not allowed to eat, which were called unclean foods. This can be seen in Leviticus chapter 11. So if any one of you are interested in finding out exactly how God segregated clean foods versus unclean foods, feel free to dive into Leviticus chapter 11 and read every single description of clean foods and unclean foods. So now, there were many laws that were given to Peter's ancestors on what they could do to be clean and what they could do, no, what they should not do to be unclean. And all these laws were not given for the sake of just having laws. These laws were because God, as a loving God, wanted to dwell with people he loves. It's just like when you love someone, you want to be with them. You want to dwell with them. And so ever since sin entered men in Genesis, mankind has always had a sinful nature. And so we are unclean. So what could the people of Israel do in order to accommodate the presence of a holy God dwelling amongst them? Which he did in a large tent called the tabernacle, which was right in the middle of the people of Israel as they lived around him. What the Israelites therefore had to do was to strictly follow all of these laws so that they could be clean enough for God. They had all these things which they had to diligently follow so that they could try their best not to be unclean, so that they could do whatever they could to be clean enough to accommodate the presence of a holy God living amongst them. So as you can imagine, these laws that were given to the people of Israel, they took very, very seriously. They tried to um, incorporate it into every single thought that they have, everything that they did. And over years, over 1,500 years, up to the point of Peter having the vision, it became very entrenched in the way of a Jewish custom. It became part of a Jewish custom. So if we could zip 1,500 years ahead back to the vision, this is the backdrop of how Peter grew up. This is the backdrop of how his um, ancestors grew up. Having clean and unclean foods was etched into the core of their being, and it was ingrained in them that there were some foods that they could eat and some foods that they could not eat because they needed to be as clean as they could for God. So therefore, when the voice tells him, hey, Peter, look, you're having a vision now. Look at all of these animals. You would recognize some as being clean, and you would recognize some as being unclean. And hey, I'm telling you now to eat them all. And oh, if you didn't hear me the first time, I'm going to repeat it a total of three times. 
So as you can imagine, if we put ourselves in Peter's shoes, this was extremely shocking to him. This went against everything that he was used to. It went against his normal. His normal was what he had grown up in. His normal was what his ancestors for 1,500 years had grown up in. Suddenly, this voice comes and tells him something that disrupts the normal. This is his new normal. And as you can imagine, he was quite disoriented and he was quite appalled at this ask. And he was like, no, no, surely not. No way. But that's not all. While Peter was considering what this vision could possibly mean, the Holy Spirit continues to tell him, oh, hey, Peter, while well, you're trying to figure out what I'm trying to tell you, by the way, there are three men downstairs who are looking for you, and do not hesitate to go with them because I have sent them. So go with them. Now, this added a new level of complexity to whatever Peter was grappling with. Poor, poor Peter. He just wasn't having the best day. <laughs> so let me explain why, what actually goes on beyond face value of having three men come to visit him. In the Jewish custom, it was unfavorable for Jews to mix with Gentiles. So a Gentile is someone who is not a Jew. As simple as that. I'm not a Jew, I'm a Gentile. If you are not a Jew, you're a Gentile too. So in the Jewish custom, Jews and Gentiles are not um, encouraged to mix together because of the same root concern of mixing clean with unclean. Because the Jewish people would be following all of these laws to make sure that they were as clean as possible as they could be for God. But if the Gentiles were not following all of these laws, then they would be unclean. And the Jewish people didn't want to associate with them so that they wouldn't be contaminated in a way with their uncleanness. So it was frowned upon during Peter's time for Jews and Gentiles to associate with each other, and even more so for Jews and Gentiles to go to each other's homes and to eat together. So here Peter is just completely confused by what is going on. First, the vision tells him, oh, look, Peter, here is a whole array of um, animals. I want you to eat them all. And oh, by the way, even though I know that Jews and Gentiles don't really mix, but what I'm trying to tell you now is I have sent these Gentiles to you, and I want you to go to the home of this Gentile. So Peter, poor guy, trying to figure out what is going on, trying to adapt to this new normal that has been sprung upon him. So even though he is confused, he decides to be obedient to the Holy Spirit because God has made it so crystal, undeniably clear that I am the one speaking to you. I have even put you in a trance so that you have no doubt that whether this is your imagination or whether it's a dream, it is I, God, speaking to you. So as Peter follows these men and goes to Cornelius' house, it is only then that he realizes this groundbreaking truth that God was trying to tell him through this series of events, which is really this, that whilst Peter's ancestors 1,500 years ago needed to follow all of these laws and regulations to try to make themselves as clean as possible to accommodate the presence of God, what Jesus did on the cross provided a way for all men to be clean so that God can dwell amongst his people through the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, because of what Jesus did on the cross, there is now no more segregation between men who are clean and men who are not clean because the salvation that has been provided through the blood of Jesus has provided a way for all men to be clean. So therefore, there is now no more segregation between Jews and Gentiles because the good news is a way has been provided for every single man to accommodate the presence of God. Now, this is huge, okay? This is extremely huge. And if you can imagine the early church, this was something that, it was like a new dimension that they had to open their minds to. And this was something that, we know from the Bible that it wasn't easy for them to immediately grasp because the book of Acts repeats this entire sequence of events twice. In Acts chapter 10, 
Um, it describes every single detail of what Peter went through from the moment he had the dream, all the, not the dream, the vision, all the way to when he went to Cornelius' house and the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And then in Acts chapter 11, the entire sequence of events in its full detail is described again because when the early church heard that Peter went to the house of a Gentile, they questioned him. They were like, hey, what are you doing? Why, can, why did you go to the house of a Gentile? And so for the early church, this new normal was difficult for them to accept because it went against, can you imagine, it went against 1,500 years of what they had been so accustomed to. And now they had to come to terms with the fact that it is not their deeds or not their efforts that made them clean, but whatever Jesus did on the cross has now provided a way for all men, Jews and Gentiles, to be clean. So after the early church grasped this truth, this groundbreaking, extended truth that now their minds were open to, what did they do? They then took that same good news that Jesus has died on the cross for men, and they took it and they brought it beyond the Jewish community, which up to then they had only been operating in, and they brought it into all the world. And it's only because they brought it, the same good news, to new groups of people and around the world that people like you and I today, Gentiles living way across the earth from Israel, far removed from Jewish people, can get a chance to hear the good news because the early church responded and operated in this new normal and they took the same good news to new groups of people. So you remember the question I asked us at the beginning? What is it about this new normal which we are operating in today that the church needs to take note of so that we don't miss what God is trying to tell us through this new? If the early church's response was to take the same good news and to bring it to new groups of people, may I suggest that for us today in our new normal, it is also to take the same good news and bring it to new groups of people. The good news has not changed. God's heart has not changed. The mandate on the church has not changed. In fact, if you see what happened in the early church and what is happening in our new normal today, I see so many parallels. A physical wall of the church has now been broken down. Today, church is online and the good news can go into far-flung areas of the world even if there is not a physical church present there. Even if there is no physical missionary there or even if there is no physical believer there, the good news can still reach the people there as long as they have the internet, as long as they have a mode of assessing the good news online. Through the past one year, I've heard multiple stories of people who have found our church's website online, who then clicked and attended church service online, who then reached out to members of our team and then gave their life to Jesus. The world has changed. And our church today operates in a new normal. If we take a parallel from what the early church went through, their new normal advanced the spread of the good news to a new level. It unlocked something so that the spread of the good news could reach more people previously not possible and previously not even considered. That is the new normal that we are operating in today, church. It is to bring the same good news to new groups of people. So the question is, what can it look like for us today? What are some examples of how we can bring the same good news to new groups of people? Let me give you a few examples. It could be as simple as sharing the link to our online service with your friends. You know, there was once, um, a few months ago, I, I took a screenshot of something that I saw in church online and I uploaded it on uh, my Instagram uh, account. 
IG stories. And I just uploaded it, not for the purpose of trying to reach new people, but I just thought, oh, this is, this is quite funny. Let me upload it. Or, um, oh, I want to honor these people who have made church online so awesome. Let me just upload it. I uploaded it. And then a friend who had not attended church for years um, replied to my story and she said, oh, um, how do I attend um, your church service? Is there a link and what time is it? And that was when I thought, oh, wow, I should just upload the entire link to it rather than um, instead of just uploading a description of something I was capturing, let me just upload a link. And so I uploaded a link and I sent her the link and then she clicked and she watched it. And then she messaged me after and she said, oh, wow, you know what? Whatever that I'm going through at work right now, um, the message completely spoke to it. And I feel so encouraged because I can't believe it is so timely that the message was the exact encouragement to my specific work situation that I needed to hear. A few days later, she messaged me again and she said, oh, you know, I'm going through this work situation right now, but... I will take courage from whatever that I heard in the message over the weekend, and I will press on. And I thought, wow, that's great, right? This, this encounter with the truth of God's word only came about because church is now online. She probably wouldn't walk in through the doors of a church service on a Saturday evening or on a, on a Sunday morning, but she was willing to click and watch the message. And because of that, she heard the good news, and it gave her hope. And that's one example of what we can do in our new normal to bring the same good news to new groups of people who previously wouldn't have heard the good news. Another example could be your expertise. Church online, realistically, is new for everyone. Our church staff, they're also scrambling to learn how do we navigate this new space. No one has done church online before. This is a new space which we have not gone down before and everyone's trying to figure our way out. So if you have the expertise to know how to make church online or know how to make the spread of the good news reach further and better, then please lend your expertise. Reach out to a member of the team and share with them um, some experience or skills that you have because we are all trying to do this together. Another example could be having more courage to have conversations with people about the topic of death or about um, God and religion and life after death for eternity. Because in this new normal and with COVID and how it's ravaging countries and lives, death has been thrust to the forefront of people's minds. People are thinking about death a lot more and they will be a lot more open to having conversations about this. Also, another example of something which happened to me a month ago, um, I got into a Grab vehicle, and then the Grab driver started having a conversation with me um, about COVID. So the conversation stemmed from the topic of COVID, and from talking about that, um, we, talk, we, we then spoke about death. And then I asked her, oh, so do you believe in God? Do you have a religion? And then we started talking about how um, Christianity believes that there is, you can be sure that you will get to heaven. Um, and it gave me a chance to share with her um, what Christians believe. And this would not have happened if not for COVID, because she would not be open to talk about the concept of death. And COVID wouldn't um, even have spurned off or if there was no COVID, this conversation wouldn't even have spurned off. And so this is another simple thing you can do to decide to have the courage to start talking to people around you about death and God and the good news that we have. Can you imagine what it would be like if we all decided to do this in our new normal? Can you imagine the unstoppable move of the good news today in our new normal if we as a church decided to respond in the same way as how the early church responded? If we decided to do whatever that we can in our communities to bring the same good news to new groups of people, it would truly be an unstoppable move of the good news in this day and age. And also, think about it, you and I, as Gentiles, we are recipients of what the early church decided to do in their new normal. Because 
they decided to respond by taking the same good news to new groups of people beyond just the Jewish community, you and I got a chance to hear the good news and get a chance to receive salvation and know that we will spend eternity dwelling with a loving God. So, church, the question I would like each of us to ask ourselves is this. What can each of us do to bring the same good news to new groups of people? There is something that you and I individually we can do in each of the communities that we have been sent to, in each of our circle of friends that we have been placed in. What is it? And I'm challenging each of us today. What is it that we can do to bring the same good news to new groups of people? Let me pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your word that is so powerful and so timeless and remains true in every situation and, and how the word truly has answers to all of life's questions. Um, we thank you for the time that we have today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll continue to speak right into the hearts of every single person who has heard this message today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would um, keep badgering us and not let us go and you would keep challenging us with this question of what is it we each can individually do to bring the same good news to new groups of people because people need to hear the good news. People need to hear that it is no longer by our efforts that we are clean enough for you but because of what Jesus has done on the cross, a way has been made for everyone to become clean. So Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak individually to each of us. Will you reveal to each of us what we can do? Will you help our spirits to be sensitive to what you are saying to us, God? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.